Today on BRS TV, we're going to talk pH, trace elements, and the BRS 160. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. We spent the last four weeks talking about various methods of replacing calcium and alkalinity while mentioning pH and trace elements at several points as well. Today we're going to give a brief overview of pH, what the effects of pH are in the reef tank, the range we want to keep it in, benefits of higher ranges, and methods of achieving this higher range. Followed with trace elements, why and what to dose. pH is a somewhat complicated subject, but for reefing there are really only a few things that are important to understand. pH is just basically a measurement of the acidity of the tank, and we're shooting for a range between 7.8 and 8.3. There are some benefits to the higher end of that range, and provided you're maintaining alkalinity properly, the biggest variable that impacts pH is carbon dioxide in your home and tank. I think the most important component of this to get across is your reef tank will be just fine anywhere between 7.8 and 8.3. So my best advice for everyone watching this is as long as you're in that range, be happy and don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. There are a lot more ways to mess up your tank chemistry than improve it when you attempt to artificially raise pH. However, below 7.8, the water will be too acidic, which will prevent proper calcification, inhibit growth, and possibly even erode the coral skeletal structure. Above 8.3, and you'll start to run into precipitation and coral health issues. The further outside this range, the worse the issues get, so it's important to stay inside that pocket at 7.8 to 8.3. So there is a reason why many reefers are shooting for the higher end of that range with a pH of 8.3. Your corals will calcify and grow faster at 8.3 than 7.8. How much faster will depend on the species and will vary a lot, but it's pretty much universally agreed that corals can build their skeletal structure faster at higher pHs. The reason for this is corals build their calcium carbonate based skeleton by removing calcium ions and bicarbonate from the water to combine the bicarbonate calcium together to create this calcium carbonate skeletal structure. The corals need to free themselves of a hydrogen from the bicarbonate. Ridding themselves of the excess hydrogen is an important component of making sure the corals can continue to create additional skeletal structure and grow. End of story, it's just a lot easier for corals to rid themselves of the hydrogen when the pH of the surrounding water is closer to 8.3. So knowing all this and understanding that in most cases it's better just to leave the pH alone as long as you're in that 7.8 to 8.3 range, if the promise of extra growth is enough for you to attempt to raise it, there's several ways to get closer to 8.3. The one I strongly recommend avoiding at all costs are products called pH buffers. In fact, if you own anything that says pH buffer on it, I suggest throwing it in the trash because there's basically no value in the reef tank. pH buffers will raise the pH, but they also add alkalinity and most often components of alkalinity like borate, which have cumulative negative effects in the reef tank. Adding pH buffers based on alkalinity additives for the sole reason of elevating pH will almost certainly result in serious imbalances between alkalinity and calcium and just a bad idea. A tank at 7.8 will be much healthier than a tank at 8.3 that has sky high alkalinity and borate levels. The best ways to increase a tank's pH all revolve around one thing, carbon dioxide. As we mentioned earlier, the number one element that impacts pH in the reef tank is carbon dioxide levels in your home and tank. Carbon dioxide will react with hydrogen in the tank to create carbonic acid and lower the tank's pH, so reducing the amount of carbon dioxide will reduce the resulting carbonic acid and increase the pH of the tank without impacting other elements of tank chemistry. Simplest way is just to open up your windows. Today's homes are often sealed pretty tightly and carbon dioxide builds up from all the people and pets inside breathing. Normal outdoor CO2 levels are around 380 parts per million, however human breath is about 35 to 50,000 parts per million, which is 100 times higher. Net result is many homes can contain levels in the thousands parts per million rather than just 380 outdoors. The amount of CO2 in the tank has a direct correlation to the amount of CO2 in the surrounding air, so simply opening a window and reducing the CO2 in your home can have a huge impact on your tank's pH and in many cases might be all you need to do to get closer to 8.3. Many of us live in summer or winter states where opening windows isn't a realistic option. You could install an expensive ventilation system, but that's probably outside of what most people are going to do to raise the pH in their reef tanks. Luckily, there's some solid alternatives. 
First one is you can draw air from the outside into your protein skimmer. There's a tremendous amount of gas exchange happening inside your skimmer, so this is a pretty easy way to increase your tank's pH. However, most skimmers operate on a venturi, so longer tubing runs are going to significantly reduce the amount of air injected into your skimmer. A good alternative to this is simply removing the CO2 from the air entering your skimmer with the CO2 scrubber media. This is probably one of the easiest to install methods, but also the cost the most because there's a consumable media involved. How long the media lasts is largely dependent on how much air the skimmer draws. If you have a giant skimmer that draws a ton of air, it will deplete faster than a smaller skimmer. Also note that you can wide the skimmer intake, so some of the air has the CO2 removed mixed with household air. You can also use a refugium to remove carbon dioxide from the tank. Growing plants consume carbon dioxide as part of photosynthesis. This is the reason why the tank almost always has a higher pH during the day when the tank's lights are on and there's all kinds of organisms consuming carbon dioxide. At night, photosynthesis stops and CO2 levels build up, dropping the tank's pH. Some reefers will only light the refuge at night to try and counter this effect, and others will light the refugium 24 hours a day to give a continuous pH boost. Keep in mind, the lights in your tank are pretty powerful, so if you have a $5 bulb on your refuge, you should have appropriate expectations. A better solution is something more powerful and designed around plant growth, like the Kessel H380. With a proper light like this and a decent-sized refuge, it's possible to consume enough carbon dioxide that it might even be a limiting factor to growth of macroalgae rather than nutrients like phosphate and nitrate. Outside of that, there are a couple of balanced calcium and alkalinity additives which have a significant elevating effect on pH, like pH increasing two parts which predominantly use sodium carbonate, also often referred to as soda ash for the alkalinity component. Kalkwasser is probably the best known pH elevating additive out there. Kalkwasser is just a chemical called calcium hydroxide. Once it's dosed to the tank, the hydroxide combines with the carbon dioxide in the tank to form carbonate alkalinity, which is used by corals and significantly reduces reduces the available carbon dioxide in the tank. Keep in mind that in most cases you shouldn't dose Kalkwasser or two-part for the sole purpose of increasing pH. Only use them to maintain proper calcium and alkalinity levels in the tank. The higher pH is just a nice side effect of using these methods to maintain calcium and alkalinity. If I had to recommend my favorite options for maintaining a higher stable pH, it would either be a solid refugium setup because there's a variety of benefits associated with well-designed refugiums. Very closely behind that, I often recommend Kelkwasser mixed in with your auto top-off water as your calcium and alkalinity solution. On to trace elements, the first thing I want to say is I've seen hundreds of tanks that don't dose much for trace elements and they have thriving reef tanks, so don't think for a moment that you need to dose them to be successful. As long as you maintain proper calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium levels with a decent water change schedule and a good salt mix. That said, there are absolutely very real benefits associated with dosing trace elements, mostly revolving around improved coloration, stronger, less brittle skeletal structure, and promoting healthy metabolic function and tissue growth. The most popular elements are probably strontium, potassium, and iodine, but there's no end to the list of elements you can buy. One thing to keep in mind is with some of these elements, the goal isn't necessarily to maintain natural sea levels. Elevated levels of some elements may have desirable effects on coloration, for example. There are a few basic approaches to maintaining trace elements, water changes, calcium reactors, two-part systems that contain trace elements, general blanket additives, and goal-based additives. Water changes are probably the simplest approach. With a good salt mix, which contains all the important trace elements, you're presumably replacing some of the elements which are consumed by coral growth and calcification when you remove some of the depleted water from the tank and replace it with fresh salt water. Major benefit to water changes is the risk of overdosing trace elements is almost non-existent, which is an important factor to note because there aren't test kits available for almost all the trace element products out there. You just have to follow the instructions and hope for the best. There's also no end to the list of successful tanks that maintain trace elements with water changes like this, so don't let anyone tell you that dosing trace elements products are absolutely required to be successful because that isn't the case. However, there's one fundamental flaw in the water change theory you should be aware of. Most reefers agree that many of the important trace elements are consumed in direct relation to other calcification elements like calcium and alkalinity. That means if water changes are a viable method for maintaining calcium and alkalinity in the tank, it's also a viable method for trace elements. However, in almost all reef tanks, we need to add additional calcium and alkalinity to keep up with demand, meaning if the corals are consuming calcium and alkalinity faster than water changes can keep up with, the corals are also likely consuming trace elements faster than water changes can keep up with as well. So as time goes on, the trace elements will always get depleted below ocean levels. This is progressive by nature, so the levels will get lower and lower as time goes on. 
If water changes are your primary method of maintaining trace elements, it might be wise to correct the levels once a year or so with a series of three or four larger 30% water changes a few days apart, designed to replace most of the old, depleted, and likely polluted water in the tank with fresh salt water. We covered calcium reactors last week, which use carbon dioxide to melt old coral skeleton and dose that to the tank. This presumably contains many trace elements, particularly those elements used for calcification. I think the automatic trace element replacement, which is inherently in close relation to calcium and alkalinity, is one of the biggest benefits to a calcium reactor. There are several two-part additives out there that contain trace elements, like ESV, where some of them are mixed directly into the two-part. Fauna Marin has some liquid elements you mix in with your two-part, and Red Sea has a similar program with four trace element bottles designed to be used in conjunction with their two-part. One thing to note is you can use both Red Sea and Fauna Marin's trace element program with bulk two-part mixes as well. You just need to adjust the amount added for the differences in potency. I have to say of all the retail two-parts, Red Sea's approach makes the most sense to me for a few reasons. First, because the amount of trace elements you dose is in direct relation to how much calcium your tank consumes, which is a balanced approach to trace elements. Second, by keeping the four elements separate, they prevent precipitation issues and maximize the amount of trace elements which can be included. Lastly, the elements say exactly what each bottle is intended to do, so you can measure the success and decide for yourself if it's worth it. This is where all the other hundreds of trace element additives out there come in. If you run bulk two-part, Kelkwasser, or retail two-part, which only includes some trace elements, you might want to consider some additional products. You can use anything from all-in-one products to a whole slew of products designed for specific applications. The best piece of advice I can give here is remember you can have a healthy, thriving tank with none of these products, so the ones that you add need to have some type of perceivable benefit. Meaning only dose those that distinctly say what they're capable of achieving for you in the tank, such as specific coloration, like bringing out reds, greens, or blues. Most of the more reputable lines have fairly accurate claims in this regard. However, if you don't see these benefits, simply stop buying them. Many will claim other benefits like polyp extension, tissue health, and increased growth. Watch for these things and only use the product if you're achieving them to a degree that's satisfactory to you. Many will likely have some fairly dramatic benefits and others hardly noticeable. There's no reason to pay for hardly noticeable. As far as these separate products are concerned, I think the HW line of additives are a good affordable option for a close to all-in-one solution. Beyond that, I think the KZ line is hands down the most proven and has the largest global group of users, most of which are very seasoned reefers and it has a robust community where they all share results. There just isn't any other brand out there that has anything close to this type of following. Many people think of KZ as the Zeobit system, which is one of the offerings, but almost all the products can be used on any tank regardless of if you use Zeobit. They have a billion tiny little blue bottles, so it can be kind of intimidating. i say the most popular are K-Balance, B-Balance, potassium iodide fluoride, and elements inside the Nano Power Package, Coral Vitalizer, Paul's Extra, Amino Acid Concentrate, and Sponge Power. If you're interested, take a minute to read the customer's experience in our reviews. Every KZ product on our site also has a link to the KZ product guide, so check it out. That pretty much wraps up pH and trace elements. Last week, we added a poll to the video and asked you what we should use on the tank. Two-part, a calcium reactor alone, or a reactor in Kelkwasser? It was close, but two-part one, I have to say the vote was a lot closer than I would have thought, and a third-party candidate probably stole the win from calcium reactor with Kelkwasser, but we're going to stay true to the results and stick with two-part for the BRS 160. This week, we're asking all of you, how do you maintain your trace elements, and what do you recommend to other reefers? So click that small I in the upper right-hand corner and vote. Note, mobile users will need to download the YouTube app to vote or see results. As always, I hope we shared something you found helpful with dosing trace elements on your reef tank. If you did, give us a quick thumbs up after you place your vote and subscribe. See you next week with week 34, testing, and one week later, it's time to start adding corals.